Hello, everyone. After a short break on our second session, uh, during this session, we are honored to present the collaborative work on publication Open Education as a Game Changer Stories from Pandemic. And this session has uh, a lot of panelists because uh, this work, uh, this publication is a collaborative effort of many people from different countries, from different parts of the world, from different, including different uh, expert uh, experience and perspectives. So I would like to ask Magda, a member of the board Centrum Cifrowe Foundation, to, to start this session and then more about uh, our publication and how it's happened that mm -hmm. we today can present um, this, this, this stories from pandemic. Uh, thank you, Karina. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad I can be here with you today. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for coming. I will very, very briefly tell you about this analysis. Uh, and uh, I'd like to focus on the question why we did it, uh, what you will find in the document, and how we did it. And in the end, I'd like to share with you key, uh, just a few key conclusions uh, from uh, our analysis. So uh, why we did the study? Uh, so the aim of this uh, analysis is to gather, uh, was to gather, is to gather the most interesting, uh, the most influential, the most powerful open education initiatives which could uh, inspire us and uh, which hopefully uh, will improve uh, educational system, education systems around the world. Uh, also, our aim is to initiate or to be part of uh, the discussion about the role uh, played by open education uh, during the pandemic, but also after the pandemic and to provide what is very important for, for us to provide arguments to support uh, public uh, policy making uh, in the area of open educational resources and open educational pra practices. Uh, so um, that is why we did the study and now why, what you will find in uh, this uh, document. So in, in our analysis, uh, we describe uh, 10 initiatives uh, from five countries, uh, from Greece, from Italy, from Poland, and from, from Uruguay, sorry, and from Brazil. And for each country, uh, we provide, a, first of all, uh, influential, specific influential, powerful stories about the open education initiatives during the pandemic. Um, and uh, what is important uh, that is that each story is connected uh, with corresponding UNESCO recommendation on uh, open educational resources objective. Um, but we also uh, quote people uh, who, um, who have been involved in these uh, initiatives. So uh, we also provide the context of the stories. Uh, we um, gather information about government's reaction to the pandemic and actions taken, actions uh, concerning education uh, taken uh, in the early lockdown. And we also gather, uh, gather um, very uh, brief information about the educational system before the pandemic in each of the five countries. Uh, so now how we did it, uh, this method methodology is very important for us. Mm. Uh, we started in June uh, by sending out um, a questionnaire to people connected with open education around the world. And we received answers, uh, we received answers, answers uh, from 14 countries. And uh, based on this questionnaire, Mm, and uh, analysis and uh, reports uh, already existed, like, for example, developed by UNESCO and other institutions. 
um, we uh, read many interesting stories. We, we read um, about many, many interesting stories around the world, but we decided to choose initiative from uh, five countries. And it, in each country, we contacted uh, one or two researchers uh, from the area of open education um, who uh, using the um, uh, desk research uh, method and uh, interviewing uh, two or even three teachers uh, described stories uh, and uh, gave us the picture of open education uh, during the pandemic in each country. And after presenting, uh, after uh, sorry, after preparing the first draft of this uh, presentation publication, <clears throat> on this public of this publication, uh, we organized a two-day workshop uh, where, uh, together with authors, researchers, and uh, other uh, open education activists, we work on the final shape of the publication. And uh, the conclusions from this workshop um, were uh, uh, um, had been incorporated in the uh, content and the form of uh, the, public the publication. So um, I'd like to share um, just two main, uh, key conclusions from the workshop. Uh, because I think they are very powerful and very important for, for us uh, and very important to understand the, uh, the, the, the research. So first of all, um, we, uh, we discover or we, uh, we uh, discuss about uh, the fact that uh, resources, uh, institutions and infrastructure built on the um, uh, open education model uh, provide uh, help, resilience to the educational systems. So countries with, uh, 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 with uh, existing uh, um, uh, open education initiatives uh, were much better prepared to, uh, to, to this uh, remote education during the pandemic. And also the second conclusion, the second conclusion uh, very important uh, for me, for Centrum Zyfrowe, uh, is that um, open educational practices uh, during the pandemic was based not only on open educational resources, but uh, also mainly on collaboration uh, and mutual support uh, and also on openness. So uh, that is what the publication is about, uh, the cooperation, mutual support and openness. And uh, that's why we, um, we encourage uh, you to make an extensive use of this material. Uh, you will find uh, this report on our website. Uh, you will find them there also um, the presentation uh, in uh, editable format so you can adjust, uh, adjust this, this publication to your needs and use it uh, to uh, fight for uh, good uh, poly, uh, open educational policies. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Thank you for this uh, introduction. From my side, I would like to, to take a chance to say a big thank you for, you, uh, for your uh, cooperation. And I know that you put a lot, a lot of heart in this project, especially on the, this, this uh, last uh, uh, slot <laughs> during the last two, two weeks. And now I would like to uh, ask Virginia Robes and Pat Patricia Diaz from Uruguay to share with all of us their stories uh, from Uruguay and to give us a bit more context to uh, better understand uh, the, the stories from Uruguay. So uh, girls, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. We are very, very happy to, to have been part of this report. Um, I'm Virginia Godet, I'm a professor at Universidad de la República, and Patricia Díaz is a professor at the Education Training Council. Uh, in, in, we are going to present the Uruguayan case. Um, first of all, uh, I have to say that Uruguay has several peculiarities that uh, differentiate it from the other rest of the countries of the region. It's a small country uh, with three and a half million of inhabitants, and uh, 
whose uh, K-12 public education with 85% of enrollment and is totally free, autonomous and self-governance. Uh, as relevant actors in the design of educational policies, open education initiatives have emerged of have, or have been supported from this governing body. Um, another important contextual data is the fact that Uruguayan schools were in a privileged situation to face the pandemic lockdown. Um, uh, due to the investment uh, in infrastructure and national capacities made in the last 15 years. Uh, we have a plan called uh, Plan Ceibal that was originally conceived as a one laptop per child plan, but now provides devices, online platforms, and resources. Uh, in addition to this, Uruguay has uh, a relatively high level of households with internet access, 93% of households uh, with children aged 14 and under have uh, access to internet. So this doesn't mean uh, that there were no difficulties. Uh, we are currently facing problems related to disengagement, for example. But without any doubt, Uruguay has uh, structural conditions linked to the existence of public educational and digital service that uh, favored educational continuity. In this context, uh, we found that K-12 uh, um, education in Uruguay is facing an acceleration of adoption of OER and repositories in our country which open a perspective of strengthening uh, that will uh, require specific policies for its consolidation. Uh, we think that the evidence uh, that emerged from this report is relevant to, uh, for example, reactivate the Open Education Working Group in public education, that is a coordination space created at the level of the Ministry of Education and Culture, and is, uh, that is currently not in session. Uh, Patricia is going to, to continue uh, in the presentation, but uh, I want to highlight that it seems important for us to share a quote from a school principal uh, we interviewed because it sums up uh, what uh, uh, we already mentioned. Uh, this is the quote. Thanks to this pandemic, teachers discovered the world of open digital resources. They don't really know that they are open. Let's leave it up to digital. I don't know if they knew that all this existed now. They are shocked. Uh, following Patricia is going to present the findings around OER repositories adoption during the pandemic in Uruguay and some examples about their relevance in developing open communities of practice around them. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, well, I want to talk about um, briefly <laughs> about uh, the access to the educational resources here in the context of emergency distance education, doing some highlights. Um, I, I am fact that uh, context uh, um, uh, the, the our uh, research is that it, it, for the last year in Uruguay, uh, the authorities have chosen to promote a strategy focused on the supply of materials in digital format. It is a hybrid uh, strategy that involves, in one hand, the negotiation of copyright with publishers and content platforms uh, developers, and in the other, the creation of repositories of op uh, open educational resources and incentives for the creation of OER. Actually, uh, we have the Plan Ceibal OER uh, repository and the Uruguay Educa repository that are our two national repositories uh, for primary and secondary levels. Uh, those are examples of how, through a systematic building of national OER repositories, a country can be prepared to face emergency remote education when it emerges. Um, we found that the usage statistics of OER repositories increased considerably during pandemic. Um, comparing statistics for the first semester of 2019 with those of the first semester of 2020, we find that in the case of uh, Plan Saibar repository, visits and users quadruplied 
And in the case of Uruguay Educa repository, this statistics uh, of use doubled. Uh, another aspect uh, that we found is that Uruguay has one of the most, most outdated copyright laws in the region. Uh, there is practically uh, no exemptions and limitations for educations and for libraries. Uh, but the issue of respect for copyright is not a concern for uh, Uruguayan teachers. We found that teachers develop a wide uh, variety of material creation or reuse strategies using both legally or illegally all available resources that they could found. Well, this is not something uh, new in countries of the global south, of course, but some, something inter interesting is that despite of this, the role of OER repositories here in Uruguay was central to gaining access to quality educational materials and educational materials that are suitable for national curriculum. In addition to this, we discovered that the most relevant aspect uh, in the case of uh, Uruguay are not uh, the statistic of use of the repository, but the ecosystem initiatives and projects that has been created around those repositories as a long-term strategy uh, planned by uh, Uruguayan authorities and uh, programs. Well, I could give some examples regarding the ecosystem of projects on training programs around repositories, but I prefer to respect the presentation time, so mm -hmm. I end here. Uh, thank you, Patricia. And I would like to just make a note that in our report, our publication, uh, you find even more and more information. And so uh, just it, this is just a, the context. And now I would like to ask Renata from Brazil uh, to make some um, introduction uh, herself and share her uh, perspective from, from, from Brazil. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, it was really interesting to see the, the report. Uh, yes, and I agree, including the artwork is amazing. And, uh, and the stories presented so far, um, Uruguay uh, and Brazil uh, have many similarities, but we also do have many differences starting from uh, the country size, which uh, when we, we first discussed about having the outlines of the countries, I realize now that they all seem, um, they all seem the same size, but <laughs> I'm just now thinking that Uruguay is the size of my state. <laughs> so <laughs> it is quite extraordinary that, um, that uh, the stories come together uh, in such a nice way, but yet there are so many differences. Um, for Brazil, uh, the most important uh, message I would have is adaptability. I think the case uh, pretty much sums it up when it brings uh, the aspect of mobile learning. So I thought uh, we talked a little bit about methodology, but I thought about sharing how I've done my specific um, uh, part of the study, which, is, which was mostly via WhatsApp. So everything was done via WhatsApp. So this is a community with around um, uh, called Praxis community. So Praxis is a term used by Paulo Freire that um, when you, when uh, in education, the practice, uh, uh, you have to reflect while you're, you're acting. So an educator must always reflect about their practice, so their praxis. So this is a community with 200 and so teachers. And I shared with them a message about the study and I got replies um, and some stories which ended up in the final study. And um, mostly they talked about uh, how they had to adapt really on a very short notice 
which was um, uh, the period that they have for adapting to the lockdown uh, landscape in Brazil was shorter than two or three days. It was really that, that, uh, uh, that much time that they had to go home and prepare online lessons for a whole month. And uh, of course, this wasn't feasible because uh, neither, uh, none of our uh, levels of uh, authority in education, the city level or the state level or the, the federal level had learning environments or had materials suitable to that task. So they started building their own WhatsApp groups and they started building their own live broadcasts and uh, they started gathering material, including digging material from repositories uh, that were official and those that were OER. So uh, it was a heroic effort of teachers nationwide. Uh, the stories that we have are teachers from state network of Sao Paulo. So we kind of limit because we see a very different scenario as well uh, using mobile in the Amazon region, for example, as you would have in Sao Paulo. It's a totally different uh, conversation there. So the teachers we have are from schools um, in the suburbs of Sao Paulo um, who uh, realized that um, they would need uh, to do it themselves. They would need to have a proactive role on uh, building live broadcasts and uh, producing material to not only address uh, students' uh, questions, but their colleagues also. So one of the teachers said that uh, she built a live broadcast to address students' questions and, and then another one to guide teachers to do their own live broadcasts. So to, to share with her colleagues this practice. And um, another teacher said that she had never come to realize the full potential of OER, of online learning. The, the situation was what prompted her to act. And uh, much on the line of what Virginia was telling us, it is a shock when you are sort of uh, put it, we say in Brazil, put in the water and put, put in the water and you have to learn how to swim. <laughs> so she was thrown in the water uh, right from the beginning of the pandemic. And she was so amazed by the possibilities that uh, she decided to, to always go back to this world of uh, online education, of open resources, of learning the possibilities of what she could use, what she could do to rebuild her uh, practice. And um, one very interesting uh, way also, I go back to my methodology because I believe Brazil has this really a uh, specific uh, trait that Brazil is the online world leader of um, uh, voice messages on WhatsApp. So none of the interviews I've made were actual proper calls. We had exchange of voice notes. And this is also what teachers do, a lot of their students. You can create groups or you can change voice messages with your students. So it doesn't really, um, fall back to a more traditional online learning environment using Zoom as we are here or using Teams. That is an exception. You would, what you would have is group video messages, uh, group uh, video calls or uh, group sharing voice notes. So it's very, um, it's even more asynchronous uh, than what we have here now. You do have, of course, the live broadcast and there Instagram plays a huge role um, with uh, the, the IGTV video channel. So we have a lot of use of reels now and bringing TikTok videos to reels. And at the same time, uh, Brazilian educators know that these social networks, and you must also remember that Brazil is a huge user. Those who do, do, let's not all share our age, but those who do remember Orkut, 
<laughs> which was a, a social media that uh, predated Facebook. Uh, Brazil was a huge uh, leader on that social media. And including, I think the, the, the person who, the founder of it uh, the, by the same name Orkut, a Turkish guy moved to live in Rio de Janeiro and was a huge local celebrity at, at, at some point. But, uh, but um, just to, to remember that Brazilians are used to these changing social media landscapes. So what we've done um, is use a lot of tools that hack social media themselves and enable us to curate and put educational materials that you want to, such as StreamYard, building several channels together. So this is, uh, in, in conclusion, our story is about adaptability and change. Thank you, Renata. Thank you for this conclusion. And also, uh, during the workshop that, workshop that uh, Magda mentioned, one of the most important conclusion, one of the most important lesson was that collaboration is the power. And, you know, grassroots uh, is a power. And uh, I would like uh, us to ask Matteo Geri from Italy, from Italian Open, open in general, open movement. <laughs> To, to present his presentation where he uh, makes some uh, summaries of uh, conclusion from our report and from our workshop. Okay, thank you very much, Carolina. Um, I'll try to, to share my screen, but it seems that I'm not allowed to do that, so no, please. No, one second, one sec. Yeah, yeah, no problem, okay. So uh, in the meantime, I can say- Now you can. Now Okay, you great, great. Now you can. Thank you. Uh, there is always yeah oh, okay some That's little issue in online communication <laughs> <laughs> okay great uh so uh hello everybody i'm very happy again to, to be here and uh thank you very much carolina all the colleagues in, in poland for inviting me in this this great forum and uh i've, I've took part with this uh let's call it research to this work we did together and uh for italy because i'm living in milan uh, one of the most hidden uh, cities in the world in the first <laughs> wave of pandemic. Um, my, my, my speech is about um, open educational practic practices, uh, especially in collaboration, networking, and grassroots movements during the pandemic. So um, what does it mean? It means, uh, okay, this is my room in Milan, so where I'm speaking from. Um, it means that uh, one of the main findings of, uh, of our work uh, is that in most uh, of the countries we, uh, we explore it, um, it, it, the movement came really from bottom-up uh, perspective, as has as been mentioned also by my other colleagues here. So uh, it, it, one of the things that um, are very interesting to be underlined is the, the fact that uh, the horizontal communication and uh, collaboration among the schools, teachers, uh, experts, activists in open education, like, like all of us, I think, like, like me, um, it was a real push forward uh, to uh, the use of uh, uh, open uh, approaches and to distance education in general in, in those countries. And uh, for instance, in Greece, you can see in this slide that is just a copy and paste from, from the report, uh, a Facebook community that worked very well. And the interaction was uh, built on solidarity among practitioners. Uh, that's, that's a word that is not used very often uh, in, in, uh, in political terms or in education sometimes, but it, it's very, very uh, um, full of, of meaning for, for me. Um, another point uh, for, from Italy, another example, these are just a few examples I grabbed from the report, is the didactics of proximity. And uh, it was supported by the municipality of Turin, uh, one of the biggest cities in Italy. And, uh, and it, it was just a website with freely available educational resources. But uh, we, we can't find such a thing at a, at a national level, at a government level. This, this really was from an initiative of one person that, that I know and that she's working in, 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 the, in the touring. Uh, city. So, um, and, and this worked very well and built up a huge repository that was shared with also other 
uh, cities and, and uh, worldwide nearly uh, for anybody who can speak Italian actually. And, um, and this was connected with practical initiatives uh, of inclusion, uh, like giving physical uh, support to uh, the less fortunate students that couldn't have PCs in their home. So it is in, on, the, on the upper right of the slide, you can see this kind of model uh, can be described as bottom plus official local support. Um, and in terms of uh, government support, nearly nothing was done in Italy uh, in terms of open education. And that's, that's really a pity, we may say. Uh, in Poland, uh, I've, I've read this, uh, this interesting initiative that was uh, alive since 2007, uh, Books for Free. Uh, already the title is nearly revolutionary if we talk about copyrights and so on. And uh, during the pandemic, this has a very strong push forward and was the only place where students and teachers could download school books in mobile format. And um, sorry for the typo, but this is uh, built from a non-profit foundation plus the help of donors, you can see in, in, the, in the bottom of the slide, uh, the percentage of, uh, of uh, income uh, to support this initiative. So this is again, uh, something that is not officially done by the government. And, and uh, as far as I understood, uh, the, the ministry is not interested in supporting the project. And this is a huge issue because uh, as has been said by, by my colleague as well, um, those uh, initiatives from the bottom or from a specific uh, foundation and so on needs the support of uh, political uh, to to survive in the long term. Uruguay, my colleagues from Uruguay had a long speech before me, so I don't need to to go deeper. But uh, it, it's it's interesting for me because in this case the government uh, was much more involved and supported uh, this. Uh, uh, their initiative with our robust pre-existing digital infrastructure. So they were more ready than us. And, and I think we, we should learn from this. Um, again, Brazil, my colleagues are speaking about this, have spoken about this. And it, it's a bottom up plus top to bottom approach. Uh, so uh, something started from the use of social media like also WhatsApp and, and similar, but um, however, uh, afterwards, somebody at the more uh, policy decision level uh, discovered how useful this was and they tried to support it. So what's the real finding for me? And it's maybe kind of obvious, but uh, we need also confirmation of obvious things maybe in this time. We, we all know that we need to invest in education, but politicians and people all around the world are still investing in, in uh, weapons or uh, silly things. So we need to promote, share, evaluate the good practice, bring them to the top. So uh, evaluating also is, is an important thing because we know that especially in the field of OER, there is a lot around, but uh, something, it's maybe not rubbish, but uh, we, we, we need to, to, uh, to choose what is the worth thing to, to be brought on an upper level and share it uh, national wide, worldwide. And that's all from my side, I try to be uh, as short as possible. <laughs> uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Matteo. And you know, from the beginning of our work on, on this publication, from, from, from the idea, we still keep in mind how this kind of publication can help, can support uh, UNESCO year recommendation implementation process. And I'm so uh, honored that uh, today we um, run this uh, session not only with uh, co-creators of this uh, publication, but also with people, with our partners from organization and from people from UNESCO who, who are involved in the process of implementation and promotion UNESCO year uh, recommendation. And now I would like to invite uh, to, to share uh, information of Zeynep Bogu from UNESCO. Uh, could you start? Yes, uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And, and we thank you that you find the time to, to be together today with us. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be with you today. It was also very interesting to read the uh, publication. 
I think just to pick up on what was said in the earlier presentations, it was, I think the first presentation you said that it was a series of stories. I think it's, a, I think it would be useful to say it's a series of non-fiction stories because mm -hmm. this is real. This is not made up. We couldn't even make it up if we tried. Honestly, there's an expression, what is it? You can't, you can't make this stuff up, you know? It's, it's, it's really happening. Um, so the congratulations really um, for, for a work which is very timely. I don't know if you're aware of some of the recent events here, but last night, um, President Macron shut down France. So basically November is canceled here and everyone's running to the hairdresser right now because there's only like 12 hours left or six hours left before everything closes completely, except the banks, the schools, K-12, and the food and pharmacies and the florists or the flower shops until the 2nd of November because mm -hmm. of Toussaint, because of All Saints Day. So this is a very timely time to speak. So I, my presentation, I'm going to go through uh, three points. The first one, I'm just going to present UNESCO. I'll go quick because I realize everybody actually knows what UNESCO is. So, mm -hmm. but I'll go quick. And then uh, the recommendation in detail. And then the link between the recommendation and, uh, and the publication. And I did like the conclusion that it's not emergency education is chaotic education for the most part and it's everywhere it's a global phenomenon and there is a in it's a, it's it's very interesting this points that you bring forward so as many of you know I'll go quickly UNESCO is a UN organization we have 193 member states we have national commissions which are liaisons with the governments and we are linked our mandate is in education communication information science social and human and we were established in 1945. We were established in 1945 by people who were very forward looking. We're based in Paris, France. There are 50 and also offices in 50 countries all over the world. Looks like this. And you'll see it's everywhere except on the South Pole. So there is an office in Uruguay in Montevideo, as you know, and there's one in Brazil for where the uh, where the stories are where the stories are coming from. And the basis of everything we do is on the human Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this was written in the 40s, right after the Second World War, before we any of us were even born, and perhaps even our parents were born. And it was before there was the internet, before there was OER, before there was connectivity, infrastructure for fiber, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They said that. We should receive, everyone should have the fundamental freedom to receive and impart information and ideas through media, any media, regardless of frontiers, mm. and the right to education. The Constitution, written about the same period, again, before any of this ever happened, or was even in anyone's wildest dreams, is states a commitment to the free exchange of ideas and knowledge and the sharing of knowledge using technologies. Sorry, Zainab, sorry to interrupt, but we don't see changing slides. So. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. I know why. Okay, yeah, okay. So, okay, so this was UNESCO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is, as you can see, the things. This is where we are, which mm -hmm. is everywhere. And this is the, const the commitments. Great. So the commitments, as you can see, we they reflect uh, very forward-looking thoughts in the 1940s. And from there, a lot of things have happened, of course, and we came to the UNESCO recommendation. So what's a recommendation? What's the big deal? UNESCO has normative instruments. There's standard setting instruments. Quite frankly, UNESCO does not have the right to ask its member states or to order is more or make its member states do anything at all even buying a pencil but we have instruments which are adopted by consensus that means everybody agrees to everything down to the last comma and there are conventions recommendations and de declarations now conventions some of you may know there is a very famous convention on the recognition of higher education qualifications in latin america and in Europe, the Lisbon Convention, for example. 
And a recommendation is the semantic meaning of the word. It recommends member states to take certain actions. And member states adopt this recommendation. They actually write the recommendation and then they adopt it by consensus. And every four years, they report on how they have progressed on this. The point is that it's in the vocabulary at the ministerial level everywhere on the planet. That's part of UNESCO, which is most of the planet. So it's a very powerful instrument in itself. Slide is tiny, you can't see it, and I did it on purpose. Um, it starts in 1989 and you see a recommendation there and then 10 recommendations later, you're in 2017. And that's to show you how many recommendations there have been since 1989, which was more than 30 years ago. So they don't come easily and they do have a certain weight. The process for this thing, and the reason I'm showing you this is not to impress you with how busy we are, but to show you that in fact, this discussion has been going on a very, very long time. And many of the people that are here have been part of the discussion at one point or another during one of these dots. You have the, we had the uh, this executive board decision. We had memory, many governmental decision discussions. There was a second world OER Congress, which many of you participated in. There were the events leading to it. We came up from all of this. Four years later, we emerged up for air and the document was adopted in the, by the UNESCO member states. It's based on a bunch of commitments that were done and it starts with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All this to say it's not out of nowhere and it has a basis and it's all links to our discussion this afternoon because our discussion this afternoon, while it's about what happened in the last six months, the solutions are found much earlier. And as the Uruguay story showed us, the further along that you are in setting the stage to the discussion, the better it is when you need to have an emergency response. So the discussions did start earlier and there have been discussed at the um, to governmental level. And so the main point here is that it's based on, this text is based on the Ljubljana OER Action Plan as it has been modified by the member states in the discussions afterwards. And that's really important because that means that these points that we're discussing, you've already been discussing them. You've already been talking about this since 2017, at least. So we're not talking about something that's new. We're just talking about an instrument that puts everything into a format, which is a sort of framework for our, uh, our work. So what does this document look like? It's, um, it, was, it has a definition. Now this definition, for those of you who were involved, know how difficult it was to get to. There was a lot of discussion and it's really important because words matter. Words matter when everything else is falling apart, you really have to hold on to something. And if you can hold on to words, then you're, you're a very lucky person. And these words have been agreed upon. 193 member states said, OER is not just free resources. It's not fr free like free, free pizza. It's actually means openly licensed. And it's not a joke. It's really openly licensed and open license means a license that refers, that respects intellectual property rights of the copyright owner and provides permissions granting the public the right to access, reuse, repurpose, adapt, redistribute educational materials. Very much involved in this process and we're very thankful for this is Creative Commons and their uh, legal counsel. And it was very useful to have this feedback and to have this definition today especially today. This was agreed upon in May, 2019 when the world looked very, very different. But today we can, when people, when uh, we have a lot of companies say, oh, well, you can use everything for free. It's okay, it's an emergency, blah, blah, blah. Well, actually, okay, that's really good, but it is not an OER. And this is the agreed upon definition of OER. And I think it's very powerful to keep in mind because words mean something and eventually things can change. And so this is something you can, we know isn't there. In terms of stakeholders, you'll see this long list. It's a huge paragraph. Uh, those of you who are in the education area may know that it's much bigger than your traditional K-12 or even university educational list of stakeholders, because usually you have teachers, parents, 
management, student unions, et cetera, et cetera. Here you have basically everyone. You have a lot of the people we've talked to, you've talked about in the book. You have ICT infrastructure providers, researchers, civil society, publishers, the public and private sectors, intergovernmental organizations, copyright holders, which is basically anybody who's produced something. Authors, media, and broadcasting groups and funding bodies are included in this list that you, on top of also, there's important to point out, cultural institutions such as libraries, archives, and museums are part of this. So it's a very large uh, recognition of what knowledge, who is involved in the sharing of knowledge, both share beneficiary and uh, th those that share it and, and the interaction. This is what the document looks like. It doesn't really look like that. This is a graph that shows it, but it's a, it's a graph of what it looks like. If you want to see what it looks like, there's a link. I think it's in the documents. I can send it to you and put it in the chat. But basically, it has five points. The first one actually has more. It has a whole bunch of preambles saying that it's based on this and this and this, like I just showed in the beginning of the presentation. And then it says there are five major areas of action for member states. First is building capacity to create, access, use, adapt, redistribute OER. What came out from the discussions is that OER is a great idea, but it's very difficult for teachers and those that are using it to be able to find them, use them, make them, redistribute them. Second of all, ensuring inclusive and equitable access to quality OER. What are we talking about here? Well, from an from a intergovernmental point of view, an educational point of view, you might notice a lot of keywords there that are extremely loaded. Inclusive and equitable access means access to vulnerable groups. And vulnerable groups is defined in the document. And that was also a discussion. Uh, key a key point here is about uh, rural urban divides, which is also comes up in the book. Um, there's also the issue of persons with disabilities, which comes up somewhat in the book. And quality OER is the great old quality assurance question, which we all love to go into, but it's there. So there's another point that's not in that wording, but it's multilingualism. And I think what's really interesting about the book is that you actually talk about it a lot. I think in the Polish example, you point out that one of the repositories is actually one of the few repositories that were there that actually had Polish language materials. And in each of the work that you're talking about in the OER, you're talking about students and teachers working with, doc with OER that's in the language of instruction of the country, rather than the fact that, in fact, a lot of OER is mainly in English, which is an issue that has to be dealt with. There has to be, we, there are a lot of languages on this planet, and it has to be representative of this fact. In terms of developing sustainability models, it's about how do you keep a system like this going? Um, goodwill is very nice, but it doesn't pay the bills and it certainly doesn't uh, take care of the rent. But you do need to come up with a system to make it sustainable. If OER is available for free and it's available openly licensed, how is it paid for? How is it done? What is happening? How, what are the different systems in place to maintain a system that can actually keep going rather than be just just to be able to keep going. In terms of supportive policy, I think in the project in the publication you bring up a lot of points about policy and it's important that there is something in place, but what does it look like? How should it work? Should it be separate? Should it be linked to another policy? Should it be at the institutional level and or the governmental level? How, how what works well? And now the fifth point is about international cooperation. It's the fact that all these issues are important within a country within an institution, but also internationally. This is a, we're using technology. We're more and more interconnected. As even as our frontier, as our borders close down, as the walls come crashing down, the doors get shut because of this pandemic. We're even more connected. You said yourself, Carolina. We're 110 people here this morning. We wouldn't have been 110 people in this room if we weren't interconnected, in spite of the fact that none of us can probably travel to each other's countries today. Mm -hmm. So how can we use this in order to bring forward this agenda? This is uh, this slide shows you a little bit about the uh, what the wording looks like. It 
basically takes up what I'm what I just said. If you want to see the whole text, please go visit the site, uh, the legal legal affairs site, and you'll see the the text. It's available in English. It's in available in all the UN languages: so English, French, Arabic, Chinese, Spanish, and um, Russian. In March 2019, we UNESCO launched the OER Dynamic Coalition. This is a coalition. I think some of you are part of this work already, and those that aren't, you're very welcome to join. Please let me know if you are not part of it and you would like to be part of it, and I'll put you on the list to receive the information on what's happening. And I'll just to get you involved in the different activities that are going to be taking place over the next months. Basically, this is taking the fifth column, the fifth box that I had in my circle and using it, the International Co uh, Cooperation Point, and using it to support and reinforce the first four. And uh, through UNESCO and through our intergovernmental role to be able to ensure a, a means of uh, cooperation and, and, uh, multi and also a vector for bilateral or multilateral work in the areas of these four points. So far, we had a launch meeting in which we had uh, we had discussions on what kinds of work should be done in this area, and I think it's it's on. I know it's on the website of our website, on the UNESCO website, the final report. And in July, we had a second meeting in which we narrowed down the work somewhat, and we had uh, basically two or three projects per each of the four points, and a fifth project which we hope to launch the first of all, which is to set up an a platform for inter international cooperation and to share information within the partners and outside towards the uh, towards uh, partners who are not part of this system perhaps yet or part of the work that's being done but to have public information on this. So this has been happening since March and uh, it has been very useful in bringing together a lot of people to discuss the different issues it place and to build the community. And we have made a very large effort to make sure that it is very inclusive to ensure that if that there, there's gender, uh, that we have a role for gender, uh, that is gender balanced, that it's regionally balanced and that it's, uh, it does touch upon the different needs that are being done. Now, um what happened so in terms of the publication i read through it I, I found it really fascinating and i read through it uh to be quite honest i read through it while there was a lot of things going on here and i think the the presentations that have been done so far uh, go into the content uh, so i won't go into who said what and where and what because you know that already but i think the things that stuck out for me was that there was this sort of dichotomy, there were the dichotomies that came out, the, what were the sort of, um, what were the things that stuck out when everything, when everything happened all at once? So there was the issue of isolation and sharing. What is the role between those two things? How can, how does the technology help? How does the fact that it's open education and not something else, what's the difference? Why does it matter? And that's the question that's been going on, by the way, a lot. Why? Who cares if it's open or not? Just share it because we need it. And stop talking and stop making problems and just get out of the way. That has been a discourse. And so what is the answer? What does it change? Why does it matter? That has been coming up. And I think you brought it up really well. And one of the things that came down to was the, also the question of the digital divide. That was fascinating because there was, I think it was, um, Italy, I think, that was saying that there was a question of the competition in the house between um, e-learning and smart working. Not everybody gets to use the internet and the devices because, you know, if, they're, if you have a lot of kids and you've got to work, then you have to, uh, you have to make some choices. And we're talking about European countries. So this is fascinating. And it's not something that was, when people talked about digital divide before, they weren't talk, that, that was never in the discussion in digital divide. It is the first time that someone talks about sharing it within digital divide in the household. Um, and then the sharing of um, the, uh, the mobile devices for, you know, what's in the house? What's do the, what does the household have? What's in the students' pockets? What are they doing with it? 
Uh, those of you who have teenagers, you know that teenagers think that they will literally die if you take away their smartphone for too long, but they won't. It's, it's medically proven that they won't die if you take away their phones, but um, it's a good idea to just take it uh, to use this, uh, this thing. Uh, the systematic building of resources, the identification of existing tools. And I think that it was fascinating, the Uruguay story was fascinating because you saw that it's something that's been happening since 2007. So when what happened happened, there was not the scramble as there was in other places because there had been some work already done. The use of social media, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and going to where teachers, uh, students are digitally, either going bottom up, top down. What would be interesting is to find out what works and what can be carried forward from that and what can't and why. And I think the, the other thing is that suddenly everybody became concerned with the same questions that we've been concerned with all this time. Data privacy, access to technology, copyright issues. They became, this became common issues that were just part of the discourse rather than something that people talk about in little meetings and then it goes, they go on with their lives. And the social media, of course, brought this home. And this is not just about education. This is about a larger societal phenomenon We're, because education doesn't happen in a, in a bubble. It happens as part of a larger societal issue. So we have to think of it this way. And the sharing of knowledge and skills and collaboration. And I think there we're really talking about the heart of if I, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is coming very close to the essence of open education, not just open educational resources. And it's a very important point. The last one is the one that I thought was just brilliant. And I, I really thought it was great that you brought this up. There was a point made that it was not just about access. And those of you, I think a previous speaker, um, Renato from Brazil, you said, let's not show our age and talk about the past too much, but I will my age a bit. As you may remember, when this all started with um, with uh, MIT, they said, oh, everything is free. It's all online. You can use it. It's open. And someone said, yeah, well, you just opened your library. Thank you very much. But now what do we do with it? And so I think you brought this argument to the to, uh, to to the present. You brought it twenty years forward in the sense that you it was outlined in the in the in the document. It's education is not just about sharing knowledge. Sharing knowledge is done through interaction, and that interaction is not just teacher learner, but it's teacher teacher student teacher student student parent student parent teacher. Everybody has to interact somehow with each other for this to work properly. And I think that was a really important takeaway from this publication and the fact that making this discussion open is hard. It's in a pandemic, it's really hard. But when you do it properly, it's very powerful. I don't know what you can do with those takeaways. I mean, the result you can get from that, but it was very good that it was brought forward. And I think that brings our discussions and our debates one step closer to something that's clearer in terms of what will really support um, open education. I have to go back to Uruguay because I, I was really impressed because I, I had been following this Plan Siva project over the years. I'd read the documents, I'd been watching it. I had, I'm, I'm not in, in uh, Latin America and I didn't follow everything that happened, but I was really surprised to see an old friend almost <laughs> from the reading that had just come up and that they were there and it worked. And I think it's a very important takeaway from the discussion that if there is a plan in place, if there is a structure in place, if there is investment, every, all of this situation is not impossible and it's not, it's actually can go forward. It can bring education one step further along than it would otherwise. Um, in terms of, I'm almost finished, in terms of, so what? How does this link to the OER recommendation? Well, you have the challenges that we just, just discussed. We have here the recommendation. And what this recommendation does, at it's really at its least, I mean, at its really core, is that it's a framework. It's a common vocabulary for us to share 
our issues and to work together to find solutions. And if we have a common vocabulary and we have a common framework from this, and this framework is not something that UNESCO made up, that this institution made up or that institution made up. This is a common agreed upon framework through a very long discourse. And it's not just you and I, it's the governments and it's the, the people who, uh, who adopted this, did it with the agreement of the heads of the governments because they represented the governments that were sitting in the room. So this is a common framework that's there. So now we, a lot of the points that we have in the challenges and realities are linked to the points about capacity building, about inclusiveness, about sustainability, about policy. And we need to find a means to be able to work together in order to get some sort of, some sort of good out of the situation that will make it so that when things move on, and they will move on one day, we actually have more. There's that horrible saying that I really don't like very much, but I'm going to repeat it, that you mustn't let a crisis, you mustn't waste a good crisis. But it's really tiring not to take, you know, to take every, turn every crisis and every challenge into an opportunity, especially when everything else around you is falling apart. But it's true that you really have to, we really have to be working together right now and I think this publication is a very important step towards actually setting up something that links to cooperation and finding the solutions. A lot of the issues that you brought up in this publication, they are throughout in each of the public, in each of the cases you say, you have, the, uh, you have similar issues coming up, but what are some solutions to be done? What are the ways that things can get better? because we have to get better. That's what humans do. That's why we're here after 2020 years. We, Because we're used to getting things to make them better one way or the other. So it's the document provides shared understanding of definitions, identification of networks and shared experiences and best practices, and a systematic means, or at least a step towards a systematic means to set up support for open. And I think that's really, really, really important today. Because not only we have to face making sure everything's okay today, we have to make sure that whatever we do today makes it even better for tomorrow. Otherwise, someone, something will happen that will make it the other way around. So what that means, we had a joint statement that some of you may have seen online. Basically, it went on to say that OER is very important. You can read the whole statement. It's on the link down below. But the last line is really important. And it's that it is now, it is really now that we must lay the foundation for integrating systematically best practices to increase the sharing of knowledge for the future of learning and the sharing of open, openly of knowledge. Because right now, everything is in the discussion. And open is more difficult than closed. But it has a larger impact. But it's up to us now to make it possible for the future because everything is up for grabs. Everything is up in the air. So I think your publication is very timely. And it's. I'd like to congratulate you on it. And uh, I think there's a lot of things happening right now that merit a lot of attention. And uh, I hope that uh, I, I wish you all the best and I would be happy to support you any way I can to, to bring forward the discussion too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zainab. And really, really thank you that in this difficult times and just before lockdown, you find time to be here and to share with us so inspiring uh, presentation and my warm heart is going to you and to, to, to France at this moment. Uh, so uh, and now I would like to uh, invite um, our partners, people who support and are co-host Open uh, Education Policy Forum for a long, long time. Uh, Paul Stacy. Igor Lesko from OE Global and General 
Wetzler and Kay Wolgreen from K Creative Commons. The floor is yours. Would you like to start? Hello. Yes. Thank you, Carolina. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Cable Green. I'm the Director of Open Education at Creative Commons. And before we get started, I just want to say thank you to Zainab for her leadership uh, throughout uh, every, all the way back to uh, 2012 and the Declaration uh, and forward to the 2017 Congress, and then getting the recommendation uh, passed unanimously uh, with the UNESCO member states. It was a Herculean task, and she led it. Uh, with dignity and, and honor. So thank you, uh, Zainab, for all of your work on that and your continued work with the, with the Dynamic Coalition. Uh, CC's worked with uh, UNESCO and NGOs and foundations and advocates around the world for almost 20 years on open education, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, as Zainab said, we, we all now have this new international instrument providing national governments specific recommendations on how to advance open education in their countries. Relevant quality resources, guidance, and services will be needed as governments, NGOs, and advocates work to help these national governments and education institutions in their countries implement the UNESCO recommendation on OER. So tying it back to this, this paper that we've all read, the open education is a game changer, governments are going to want to see case studies like those shared in the publication as they decide which parts of the recommendation they'd like to implement first. Case studies can help governments understand what other governments are doing. They can help governments understand if they are ahead or behind with open education implementation. They help governments ask questions like, who might I contact, learn from, partner with? What challenges are other governments experiencing? What strategies are others using to work on open education? Open education advocates can also use these case studies for all the same reasons as they work with governments to implement the recommendation. Uh, a few possible next steps, which came out of a two-day meeting that a lot of us had uh, around the paper a week ago, uh, we talked about uh, maybe having a common case study template uh, so that additional national case studies uh, could be created. And then if we had a common template and multiple other countries that were using that template, we conceived of a future where we had a searchable database so a, a government could go in and search against particular parts uh, of any of the case studies. Uh, with that, I want to pass the mic to my colleague, Paul Stacy. Thanks, Cable. And yes, uh, such great work being presented here today by everybody. And so it's a uh, it's a privilege, of course, to do this work. And I wanted to share with you all one of the initiatives that has been emerging in parallel with the adoption of the UNESCO OER recommendation. It became a kind of apparent in the fall of last year that ACID seemed like the recommendation would be adopted, that there was a need for us to think about how we could scale the provision of support and services in aid of governments who choose to pursue that recommendation. And so, um, so, uh, so Open Education Global began to, to reach out and look to partner and form a collaboration of other, let me call it sister organizations, other organizations that have been advocating and supporting open education work around the world. And we've since been meeting every month, the first Tuesday of every month, uh, we have a meeting of what we've been calling the Network of Open Orgs. And the whole uh, thinking and formation of this network uh, started with the UNESCO OER recommendation and trying to form a collection of efforts that could come together in a coherent and coordinated way so that when governments start to pursue the adoption of the OER recommendation, they have some entities that they can turn to for help. And so uh, the that's the kind of purpose of our work. We're trying to scale the support that might be available for governments. And we're also very keen to see what might emerge as the needed top-down support that many of you have called for as the, as the response to the pandemic, yes, but also in an ongoing fashion, countries start to address the opportunities associated with open education. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll make one last comment, which is that when, when we talk about the 
recommendation being adopted by 193 member states of UNESCO. I think it's really interesting to think about, well, just who are those member states? And here's a list. And you can see even in today's presentation about the case studies from all of the five different countries that each of those five countries are actually member states that have agreed to adopt the recommendation. And I think it's gonna be incumbent upon us as, as leaders and participants in this field to encourage, to prompt, to, to kind of uh, ask our governments what they're doing around the OER recommendation and how we can help and support. Um, I wanna turn it over now to uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Jenren and Igor to finish just talking about what the Network of Open Orgs is doing. Jenren. Thanks so much. And I just wanted to echo the, the thanks to our fellow panelists and also to organizers for this, this forum. I think Zainab was mentioning that it's pretty incredible that we have so many more people now engaged, even though we're all um, in our home offices or our homes. So. Um, thank you so much for making this possible. Um, so today I actually wanted to invite you all to an opportunity. Um, we are working on a series of brainstorms to kind of augment and add to the, the growing list of resources and, um, and support that um, we can soon offer uh, UNESCO governments working to implement the, the recommendation. So right now we have a series of brainstorms that we're we're fielding to different communities in three different conferences, and now we are delighted to extend this opportunity to this community, since there are clearly overlaps among you and um, folks at our various conferences, but I think also some, some big differences too. So the first, uh, the first conference that hosted a brainstorm session was actually last week, it was our CC Summit, and um, that resulted in some really wonderful resources that we'll share in a second. Next week, we're also going to have a, a brainstorming session at the Open Education Conference 2020. And then following that, a week after, we'll host the final uh, brainstorming session at Open Education Global. Um, so kind of back-to-back -back conferences with slightly different communities. Each conference is a chance for us to build on prior outputs from the different brainstorm sessions. So what we wanna do today, realizing that our time is limited, we want to offer you a chance to look at the documents to understand what we're looking for and then contribute in your own time off, you know, after this, this forum is concluded. So what we're looking for are a couple of things. First, we're looking for people to share ideas about their own individual needs or their government needs, um, existing resources that they, they might know about, or also organizations that are working at the international or local context that can assist. We're open to recommendations on any different stage of, of implementation that governments might be at. So if, if folks are just getting started, we're looking for resources there. If people are ramping up and already have some projects underway that um, might benefit from additional support, additional suggestions are welcome there. Or even if there are countries that are at full scale adoption of the UNESCO OER recommendation, um, sharing what they're doing is also really helpful for other countries to see. So Cable had mentioned case studies. We're always um, eager for more of those. Um, as Zeta mentioned, there are five areas of the UNESCO OER recommendation um, for action areas. The fifth one, as she mentioned, relates to collaboration. So we're not, we're not um, dealing with that here. We're looking at um, organizing thoughts around the four other recommendation areas. So building capacity of stakeholders to create access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER, developing supportive policy, engaging, or sorry, encouraging effective, inclusive, and equitable access to quality OER, and nurturing the creation of sustainability models for OER. So these, these four action areas are broken down into four different documents, which we'll share in the chat in just a second. And we'll invite your, your thoughts, your ideas. And if you have any questions as you can run through these documents, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. We're really looking forward to your thoughts. I think that's it. Thank you. Over to Igor. Thank you, Jenrin. And hello, everyone. Thank you to the organizers. And hello to all the attendees. I am aware that we are kind of short of time, so I'm going to be very brief uh, with my input. 
Um, so as Janine has already mentioned, uh, well, we are going to share these links to these documents in the chat window. And some of uh, there is already some input that was generated from the CC summit. And some of the attendees, just having looked at the, the list of attendees in this session, actually did participate um, during the first session. Um, many of you and also the attendees here uh, have been working on, let's say, policy related matters or have aspirations to do so in the future. So, and also just other areas of the, of the recommendation too. So your input here is really important. Um, you are strongly encouraged to also articulate what kind of needs you have. Um, that's really important. This information that, we, that you're gonna provide into those documents, we are then gonna use it, consolidate it and bring it forward to the network of of open organizations for further discussion and input and based on the needs that are gonna be expressed uh, through the different fora and also with your, with your participation, it might then include uh, the further actions of, of the network itself in terms of how to effectively respond to the identified needs uh, through the activities of the network itself. And um, then I would just like to say thank you for Cable Engineering and others too for sharing those links in the chat window to the to the, to the upcoming two events. Uh, so the next one is the Open Education Conference uh, during the second week of November and then Open Education Global Conference, which is the conference organized by Open Education Global. And then finally, um, as Paul has mentioned, I mean, there are, there are quite a few uh, member organizations of the network. Uh, we actually, some of the representatives from um, some of the organizations are present here in this session too. So we have got knowledge for all I've noticed and we have got Open Education Policy Hub and this is obviously CC, Open Education Global and others. And uh, also Wikimedia, Commonwealth of Learning, ICD, OER Africa, uh, quite a few other organizations, but we actually uh, would like to encourage you to to express your interest if you would like to join the network as well. And particularly if you are operating in the global south or countries, specifically countries in the Latin American region, South American region, Africa, Middle East or Southeast Asia. And if you would like to do this, uh, you can send an email to Paul here. So Paul, please also uh, drop your email address into the chat window. And that's all. Thank you. Sorry for the rapid response, but I'm just mindful of the time. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you for, for uh, all important information. And uh, we also in uh, the email that summary of the of forum, we put all these links that you share on chat. So uh, yes, and now I would like to ask uh, Alec for, for final comments and for some summary for our session. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this was for me very interesting the way we moved from uh, presenting very specific cases by people who are sort of very close to them. Uh, Renata, your example of how in a situation where education happens on the phone, you also research it on the phone was, was very powerful. To a demonstration, how we can build support structures uh, for uh, these initiatives uh, I think this demonstrates exactly what needs to be happening. Uh, I think this research demonstrates something that was recently said by the Secretary General of UNESCO, that teachers are the first responders. So they are like uh, ambulance uh, teams, they are like firefighters, um, and, and we usually don't think of them that way. But again, when Zeynep says that in France, the, seven, the only few things left that are open are schools. This is very moving and people working them are doing now a very hard work. So for me, the, the most important thing in all these stories is that A, they demonstrate amazing power of teachers when they network, when they collaborate, when they do what a lot of people in the report call building communities of practice to respond. But then very quickly, the story, the question becomes what next? How do people who are overburdened stress, uh, living in difficult times are meant to continue doing this. And I think there is the, they need support structures. So I think first of all, this very well demonstrates what is the role of public institutions. The, uh, I like the stories like the Greece one where there's a student, uh, a teacher community built and suddenly a governmental institution comes and says, we will connect with this, we will support this. I think this is very powerful. Uh, but I think I also want to just summarize what I just heard, which I think, again, is very strong. We, are, we can also be such a support structure. I think that it's great that 
as I said, we move from event to event, uh, and you demonstrated better than I did because I forgot about the CC Summit, of which I was very proud, but didn't mention it. And then there will be events in 21, which we don't yet have on our radar. And I hope that on this scaffolding and on this new effort to build the network of open organizations, we can also collaborate uh, and, and find ways how we as the civil society can support maybe not these whole teacher communities, but for instance, activists all around the world. Um, I wanted to say that this is something we tried doing. Uh, maybe this last thing I want to highlight, you know, we really wanted to tell stories from uh, countries that you maybe often don't hear about. Um, I don't think we succeeded fully because uh, we didn't, we weren't able uh, to reach everywhere. I think there are still many stories untold. We have some uh, commitment to uh, continue doing this, uh, but I think this is um, an important contribution we wanted to make. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, this is enough. I, it, it's a bit poetic uh, in Cable's uh, uh, video stream. I can see that it's getting light outside of his house. <laughs> uh, my window, which you cannot see because it's in front of me, it's now completely black and I started with just a bit of sunshine, which is a nice metaphor of time passing. Thank you, Alec. Thank you for, for this nice summary. And just to uh, let you know that, because I noticed on chat that there are some ideas how we should develop from the publication. So I dropped the email uh, to me. So if any one of you would like um, to help us with uh, developing this publication or promoting, you can reach me with your ideas. And I think it's time for a break.